Hey everyone, it's Travis. We'll keep this super brief. One, uh, Domain of the Nameless God is available for purchase on dmsguild.com. A link is in the show notes. It's also available on our Patreon. Speaking of which, our amazing soundtrack was only possible because of listeners like you, who support us through our Patreon. So link is also there in the show notes. You can get our entire soundtrack plus Domain of the Nameless God on our Patreon, along with bonus stories and other audio creations by myself and Caitlin as Fool and Scholar Productions, like The White Vault, like Vast Horizon, and like The Liberty Podcast. Speaking of which, if you liked this production, you might really like Liberty Vigilance, which is another story we made before this one, which is a heck of a lot of fun on the Liberty Podcast feed. Does it sound good? Let's hear a quick teaser. The leading and most physically intimidating man, despite his ponytail, motions for the team to walk closer. You're in small hand territory. You gotta pay something to talk to safe. Small hand territory, huh? I don't think I've heard of you. Well, you must not be round from these parts. No, we're from about four to six hours north of here. Well, we're the hardest gang in this land. And if I was to pay you something, a, a toll, something like that, how would you accept it with such small hands? <laughs> <laughs> he pulls out a knife. Again, you can find Liberty Vigilance as part of the Liberty Podcast feed, which is a bunch of other really great stories like the upcoming Minds and Mysteries coming out in March. Finally, we wanted to also remind you that we are doing a crossover episode in the coming uh, couple of episodes with the Lucky Die podcast. That's right, our very own Rowena has her own show. She's the DM of it. It's a lot of fun. You'll recognize many friendly and familiar voices on it, like my own, uh, as various characters and NPCs. It is truly a pleasure. If you should check them out, they are the Lucky Die podcast, otherwise known as TLD. You can find them also in the show notes. Okay, so I guess there's no more avoiding it. Let's get something to bridge us into the final episode. Shalis de Pace. Salis. Do you seek him? 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 Do you seek the nameless god? You have found yourself among the dead and the damned. Your journey ends. As previously, it was foretold. A herald from the dark lands will awaken the nameless god, cast it loose upon the world. The resolve has been shaken. There is no more hope for victory. Fear the strangers in your midst. Never play games of fate. Dark Dice, Chapter 16 The Long March Combat had effectively concluded, but the nameless god in all its sinister waking glory was not far behind the team. As they ran the quarter-mile slog back to the entrance of the unholy temple with warping dimensions, Father Sindri Westpike and Monster Hunter Soren Arkwright both found their eyes drawn to look back, against warnings from their companions, more by curiosity than compulsion. Fuck no. I need to know what we're closing in here. I'm not stopping. I'm going to carry this small child, and I'm not stopping. I'm just leaving. I don't care if these guys don't follow and die. Me and this small girl that I made Thunderwave, we're getting out. So, no, I'm not having any more of this shit today. Soren and Sindri looked back and saw something massive that had pulled itself up from its millennial slumber. Their gaze found the middle of the thing. If it could, in fact, be called a thing at all, a purple throb of the abyss stared back at them. An infinite vastness of stars surrounded by a strange chitinous mass of teeth. Their sanity was tested, as they realized that the cosmos itself was the thing that approached. The hideous colors they had never seen before began to violate their perceptions. Ninety-six. Sindri seemed all right as Soren caught up to him. At first, Sindri's run slowed. Then, gradually, jaw gave way to trudging limp. 
The old man bore a wide grin as he began to silently cackle to himself, still staring back over his shoulder, now coming to a halt. Sindri, who was under far too much stress, shifted his expression to one of fear as he began to quietly gasp for air and fall to the ground, clutching his lungs, trying to tear the armor off his body. Aias, far ahead and holding two children, would never know of this, and Rowena, self-described as running with the girl, would never witness these final moments. But Sorin, he chose to stop and attempt to calm the old man despite the futility of the situation. Oh, the fuck! I still have my inspiration! Let's change that to, uh, twelve. But the moment passed. Soren pulled Father Westpike's shirt down, turned him away from the coming void, and physically pulled the heavy dwarf, trying to aid his unresponsive companion. And in the moment, it may have been Pelor. It may have been the guilt of his young cousin Rowena having to hold a funeral for the old dwarf. But something clicked, and all at once Sindri began to move again, one foot in front of the other, returning to a full run, followed closely by Soren. The two men had seen the true face of evil, had seen the nameless god, but only one of them would remember it. Each took 15 stress damage as a result of their successes, and as they passed the entrance to the horrific temple, Soren dared glance back again, and saw that the void was now almost motionless. Still its quick shifting movements could be discerned, but at some kind of glacial speed. Sorn did not even try to figure out the dimensions or shape of the doorway, and had to catch up with Father Westpike, who was now hopping the path of the abyss toward the stairs and the far wall. It was a silent journey, and a very difficult one. Sindri lost his footing at two points, nearly falling into the chasm the first time, then missing a step entirely, vanishing instantly from view as he fell between two large steps. The quick reflexes and dexterous movements of Soren caught Sindri the second time, and he noted the blank expression on the old man's face, the lack of reaction even as Soren pulled him up by his very beard. Soren could not see Aias or the boys, far ahead as they were, and hoped that all of them had made the jump safely. Soren glanced back one final time as he reached the wall, and still could not see the movement of the void that would one day consume the world. He stood there pondering, and thought to issue a silent prayer, a plea to some god, any god. But he could not even find the will. Part of him, perhaps, had wanted this to happen. This thought troubled Soren, even as he rounded the last set of stairs and closed the trapdoor behind himself. His companions were gone, save for Sindri, who was staring vacantly at the two paths that led from the great archway. Soren thought he could make out a blur of motion across the plains, reaching the edge of the woods as he pushed Sindri through the portal, and followed his instincts to follow that path, instantly teleported a few hundred feet down the path. He and Father Westpike ran toward those woods, toward a path they knew would take them home. As a storm brewed overhead, and more viscous orange sap began to fall from the sky, lightning and red hues had overtaken the night sky, and where the sky was clear, Soren noted the constellations themselves were slowly shifting as well. As they reached the great trees a few minutes later, the trees began to crack, crack, as if on fire, struck by lightning, splitting their fleshy bark, which pulsed and oozed with a red glistening sap. Pustule knobs also popped loudly as strands of dark moss fell in clumps. Ahead, Soren could see Aias and Rowena in the thick of it, Blades drawn, crossbow bolts ineffectively landing in the bark of a particularly large tree that stood in their path. As lightning struck nearby, Rowena yelled as she ducked a thick swinging vine branch covered in long black moss. As the tree's seven hissing faces began to emit a low rattling rasping sound, the visages of fetuses began to emerge from just above the roots. Ias pulled the children to the right as well, accompanied by a powerful but ineffective rapier swipe. Sindri seemed to not even see the creature, but the firm command from his cousin set his body to swift motion, and Soren kept his distance as they continued around the creature. The crackling storm and sap continued for another hour, accompanied by the bang cry of infants, the harrowing rasp of hollow jaws, and the laugh-like cackle of bark. The terrain did not change much over the next few hours, which allowed even the most tired of the children to maintain a steady march despite shaking limbs and burning lungs. The entire party succeeded in various tests of endurance, and after several more hours, they finally reached the safety of the large black gnarled trees. Rowena, still carrying the injured girl, and after quickly and quietly explaining the situation, received her second level of exhaustion, reducing her speed by half, 
as the rest of the party began to feel the effects of the first level of exhaustion, which reduced their effectiveness in most dice rolls as their concentration waned. Hickles, could you please carry odd for a little while? <coughs> yes. <coughs> It was an hour after that the old archway slowly climbed into view. Pursued by the void itself, and remembering the beast that lurked in this place, the team did not even hesitate as they passed through, buying themselves valuable time. As they continued their next stretch, which was a full 18 hours of blackened forest, their terrified enthusiasm faltered only to prepare their lights and occasionally adjust their path to avoid the resonant sounds of chimes that seemed to now approach their journey at random. Despite themselves, they were able to maintain some degree of stealth during these moments. Father Westpike was not even the most pale as the march had seemingly put the boys within one foot of the grave. The trees gradually shifted to become more sparse again, and the temperature rose as they reached the strange and mysterious liquid that forced their pace to slow. More than 36 hours since their last rest, drudging through, they continued through the muck for two more hours, in eerie silence hanging in the air, which might have come sooner since they left the chimes and cackling trees behind, but they only just now noticed the silence. Their feet rubbed raw two hours later, even further, the terrain shifted back to those blues, browns, greens, and vibrant purples. Their limbs burned, their shoes had found wear and torn, their feet were raw, throbbing and aching as the next and final archway came into view. They did not hesitate as they passed, continuing down the path, past the dense purple, orange, and gray vegetation. Now, each hero carrying a child, except for Rowena, they continued for more hours, and more still, and more still, until finally Father Westpike's frail constitution failed him. One moment, he was simply walking, murmuring something to himself in dwarf The next, the thought of chainmail as both he and the child lie face down and unconscious. I'm gonna run to him. I, uh, I, I struggle in my very slow state. Um, look, guys, we have to stop. If you two can keep going, do it, but we have to stop. I'm sorry, but we have to. I can't leave him. Oh, fine by me. Except that I'd like all the children to stay together, and it doesn't seem like Sauron and I can carry all three of them at once. Surely we can leave Odd with them. Sauron, I'm many things. I've done many things, but I won't allow myself to fail to bring someone's kid home. Let's set up camp. Okay. I'm sorry. Do you mind taking the first watch? I'm done. Soren's senses detected a certain stillness in the forest, and it upset him deeply. Looking further ahead off the path, some sixty feet away, he saw it. Lord God. The silhouettes of a dozen figures garbed in animal hides, wood and cloth. The figures bore blades or bones mangled with their limbs as they dropped quietly to the ground, eyes aglow with hellish reds and yellows. The figures were led by a tall, gaunt figure, still adorned with the skull of a unicorn and the tattered, fleshy cloak, whose posture revealed a certainty it lacked in their last encounter. As Soren was the only one to see this, he rolled initiative to see how much time the team had. Natural 20. Everyone, get up. The silent one, he's back. There. A dozen figures or so are with him. Oh, we, we could try bargaining with them. My clan, the, the cloak I was wearing here when I first got here, I, it belonged to him, my family. My dad have much more of their stuff. We could we could try trading. I'm going to open my bag of ball bearings. Oh, this is going to be good. Ayas opened his bag of ball bearings. And chuck him at one of them. Really? <clears throat> the bearing bounced harmlessly off the creature, who glanced down at it briefly and was able to maintain its footing while crossing the obstacle. Oh. As the creature ran closer, blades and edged bone menacing toward the party, Father Westpike awoke suddenly. By the light of his grace, oh my always God, go for it. The shit out of me. Where we stop, we need to go forward. Please. As the party pulled their weapons, creating a barrier between themselves, the silent faithful, and the children, and as the stench of rot reached them, and the first of the creatures would reach the team. 
A low, sonorous call of a nearby horn cut through the air immediately, seeming to resonate within their chest and eardrums, but outside them as well, giving way to a previously unknown and somehow primal fear. The figures all around them glanced in the direction of the sound behind the party, hissing as they turned to flee in scattering directions, one of them notably slipping over the ball bearings. The silent one was the last to flee, never seeming to turn its body away from the source of the sound. As the party turned to face the call, a blinding colorless light shot through the woods as the sound of muted hooves drew closer. I don't know, I don't know what fresh help this is. And as the light diminished, a wide gigantic form stood before them. Their vision returned, giving way to details as the figure, revealed to be a humanoid on horseback, was now clad in immaculate plated armor that gave off a slight glow. The armor was topped in an ominous fluted helm, and the figure donned a remarkably intricate cloak that seemed to change color with the trees and constellations above. It took a few additional moments to realize that the figure was mounted atop an unbarred creature, a wild horse with a long mane and a single bony horn protruding from the center of its head. The figure addressed the team through the fluted helm loudly. Shalis de Pace, Sales! In Old Elvish. Are you those that seek him? Ah, oh, shit, am I still the only one who speaks Elvish? I don't. Yep. Soren and the children notably stared at the armored figure with a silent reverence or perhaps fear. We came to seek the children in Old Elvish, obviously. The figure raised their masterwork fluted faceplate to reveal a pale slender face, unmarred by the effects of time, yet weary, holding a certain implacable sternness in her eyes. Her hair was wild, yet braided, and she spoke in an old dialect of Dwarvish. Dwarves, you speak Dwarvish. Hey. Yes, I do. I am called Yaneiros, and I am a guardian of Saivistol Tisair, the Shifting Woods. What brings you here? We just want to go home. So you are not followers of the Nameless God? No. No, its followers brought us here through trickery. And they took my son, but we rescued him and the other children here. That is fortunate. You simply wish to leave. I may assist then. You do not look well. I'm frankly put, we're exhausted. I'm fine, I just need to... Shut up, and I just help him to his feet, clearly unable to stand. We've been running for a very, very long time to get away from all that. As I said before, I am a guardian of this place. With me is Aradan the forest's original guardian. He can help you. The elven woman stepped off her mount, yet still she remained an imposing figure. The unicorn gently stepped forward, extending its horn in a friendly gesture. Help us, how? Sintra is trying to lift this hammer to threaten the unicorn away, but he can't. I don't. I just, I just, I don't take any of that crap. I just, like, have my arms clamped around his so he can't lift them. Eredin the unicorn placed its horn atop the hole in Father Westpike's shoulder armor and nudged him. A strange glow emanated from the horn to his wounds. Then Eredin's head moved to Rowena, then Ayas, then the children. Finally, to Soren, nudging them each respectively, filling their weary limbs with renewed vigor as the strange glow landed on each of them. The mithril-clad elf chanted in a low ancient tongue as nearby trees shaped and shifted, giving way to one which grew into a large maw that led deeper into the earth itself. Here is a path to return you from whence you came. Where does this lead? To where you have tread previously. Yeah, let's not look a gift unicorn in the mouth. Let me try this in Elvish, just so we're clear. No, I mean, where exactly will it take us back to? Will it take us to within all of these random tunnels, or maybe outside, beyond the Great Gate, or like back to where we all originally came from, like our hometowns and stuff? It will take you back through whatever Great Gate or portal you use to get here, to return you to your rightful plane and flow of time. Uh, So, I think I heard the words for Great Gate, and thinking on that topic, is it up to us to seal it with, um, with blood and such? I am sure the King will seal the gate upon your return. Or his hand, the lord of Sikari Bolandri, our gate village. Just let the king or lord know there have been problems, and they will send sacrifices willingly. Each of the great gates function in this way. However, the ones here within this realm 
have faded and are no longer as effective as the Great One near the village. Which king? There are many who call themselves king nowadays. Lord Bithir. I don't think I know him. Uh, say this in common. He's a very old elven king who's been dead for a very, very, very long time. So, the continent we all live on was once ruled by elves and such. You know, the elves who were kinda like, mean and do stuff to save the world. He was like thousands of years ago, many, many, many thousands of years ago. Kinda one of their kings. I'm gonna switch to Dwarvish. Oh, I hate to tell you this one, but uh, your lord's kinda dead. Been dead for many thousands of years. Time moves differently here to where we are, and a lot of time has to pass since you were there. This is... unfortunate. But the current Lord of the Vale shall surely help. Yeah, about that. Then one of you must make the sacrifice and seek the new Lord of the Vale. We shall hope that none find a way to unseal the gate in your absence, while you seek out my people or suitable sacrifices. It's okay, I think I know how to find them. Since you bring me... Unkind news. Please, pray tell, how are the other guardians? The twin shields. <sighs> they have been tortured and removed as far as I could tell. Well then, I will continue the Araser Bondror, the eternal vigil, on my own. Evil will not prevail. So, the nameless one might be coming this way, and if that's the case... You're going to get swallowed up. You speak as if it were awakened. Uh, no, no. Actually, these kids were the intended sacrifice, but as you can see, they're safe here with us, so there's nothing to fear. But uh, what my companion means to say is that you may need to keep an eye out for its followers. Buggery bastards. We will protect the forest from their baleful influence in any way that we can. That is my vigil and our purpose. The unicorn Eridan stared at Aias with the unmistakable look of pride. The place of shaping trees, the forest, is connected to the world through a series of gateways. Though you found a way here, maybe so much time has passed that runes, wards, have begun to wear down. Perhaps a new entrance has been unsealed that I have not yet discovered. I will find this entrance from within the forest. We haven't time, though. Dwarf, remember, you must give generously to the Great Gate. All right. We'll be on our way. Thank you. The God's blessing on you. Travel quickly. Taking one last glance back, the team passed into the darkness of the hollow and began their journey back through the dark tunnels all over again. Recollection and stress taking its toll in the form of five stress damage. The journey took ten hours passing through the same dark tunnels, the same hellish passages once again. The glistening living walls, the gradual incline, and, after far too long, the return of the giant stone passages. At one point, one of them tripped over a ball bearing, but it hardly even registered as they got up and continued their slog. On the far side of the final archway, the party emerged into a room of curios, where they hardly noticed the absence of the spirit. Fatigue had given way to near fugue, one step following the other with little regard for well-being or surroundings. So terribly worn as they each took an additional level of exhaustion, they passed right through the room with the six pillars, hardly noticing the small stone fountain near the far entrance, the two wooden desks, the one wooden chair, two mannequins, a dresser, and a pile of decaying fabrics in the corner. Rowena, however, remembered to pick up Sister Savorite Caverns Falls effects that were left behind at this place. The long hallway brought the team to the corridor, which led to a stone sturdy door, the back of the Great Gate itself, which was closed and still as large as ever. This is the door. <laughs> that could be sealed by blood? Or do you think we open it and we find ourselves in the crack? The what? Or perhaps the nine hells? <laughs> oh, or just the other side of the door? That would be nice too, eh? Just three days or so from home through the pines? It's the... the... a massive door that we entered by using a spell word. I... I... I forget the word. Abracadabra. The door immediately began to move, its grinding weight covering the noise of a muted pop. And in the same instance, a thin-bladed wire rushed toward the team from somewhere behind them forcing them all to make a dexterity saving throw to avoid being sliced open. 
and the sanity saving throws that were failed by all involved except Soren and Ias. The wire cut deep into Soren's legs, flipping him prone in an instant. Uh, then it cut less fiercely into the backs of Father Westman, uh, Ias, uh, and Rowena, uh, who moved to protect the children and were knocked prone immediately. Great fox! As everyone uh, moved to stand, they could see the damage dealt to poor Soren, uh, whose bones and muscles were plainly uh, visible. His leg is hardly still attached. The, the door's gonna close. Grab Soren and help me pull him out. Sindri, stop being a... Oh. Rowena, we'll heal him when we get through. Rowena and Ias were able to drag Soren beyond the gate before it closed behind them. And as they quickly healed his wounds, their bodies slowly took notice of their surroundings. The air beyond the gate was cool, fresh, crisp, and the gentle sunlight was a warm change of atmosphere. As they helped Soren up, they found themselves in the pale light of the morning, and their memories suddenly had... well... they had difficulty sorting out what they had actually seen and experienced in that darkness. With the world so real and calm around them that it made them question if any of it had been real, or if it had all been part of some horrific nightmare. As parts of their collective adventure were cast aside and adapted as fanciful day terrors brought on by the stress and lack of sleep, the presence of the children would seem to validate at least some parts of the story. Ias's crippled arm, pitted face, and the very clear scar lining his neck. Sindri's shoulder and hands, the scar on Rowena's face from her encounter with the Silent One, and the shoulder scar she shared with her cousin, compliments of Siljal of Strathman, and of course Soren's freshly injured legs. These mementos reminded them of a task that now lie ahead of them, as they stood in the presence of the massive stone archway. Six unlit torches separated ancient characters, massive runes, and hideous gargoyles hewn into the stone that made up the ancient gate. The carved figures represented were compromised of stern-faced humanoids, ravenous monsters, and freakish abominations. Two large statues flanked the edges of the arch, and somehow one of them looked vaguely familiar. A gentle mist limited their visibility to eighty feet, and despite the thin layer of snow that covered the ground, they could make out the marked grave where Sister Karen's fall's body surely rested. Father Vespike goes over to the grave and says a short prayer, uh, before he moves back to the group and promptly falls to his knees and says, We must rest before the deed must be done. I don't think it matters if we rest or not. We have to... You two and the children need to go. And she looks at Ives and Sindri. No, not before we rest. We must make this decision with a clear mind. What we're about to do will change everything for us. It's pretty simple. It's not your two's decisions. It's Sora and mine. You two have families. Soren, do you? No, I don't. Then it's up to you and me. I agree. You two have families. You have a kid. I'm literally looking at yours. You have a wife and a son and a daughter. Father Westpike is like leaning on his hammer at this point, trying to get back to his feet. Nonsense. I've lived a full life. It's a life I'm glad I've lived. Though this is not the ending of my story I would have wished for, but this is this can be my grave. I'm going to punch him. He takes it straight onto the face and falls on his ass. No. <laughs> I will be the one to choose. <laughs> well, they're distracted. Can I plunge the murderous dagger into my own heart? No! Well, not expecting that. Um, <clears throat> Soren glanced at the hole in his armor where he'd been stabbed and aligned the hole with his heart. The dagger plunged deep into Soren's chest, blood spilling in an instant, sealing his fate almost immediately. Soren's eyes widened, and a look of genuine surprise, perhaps at the pain, crossed his face as the air itself seemed suddenly heavier. On his back, breaths became more labored and tears were shed as the children realized what he'd done. Rowena had somehow caught him as he fell, guiding Soren gently to the ground. Oh, God, I'm so sorry, Soren. No, Sindri, in, in your left shoulder, you'll find something really fucking sharp. Give it to me now. Uh, I, I give it to her. It's my lucky caltrop, and I'm just going to give it to Soren. I don't know if it's too late to give it to you, but we've got to see if we can make this work. As the blood left Soren's body, Presumably drawn toward unseen markers beneath the snow, Ias closed the eyes of the children and guided them a few feet away from the scene. Yet, as the blood began to pool on the ground, Rowena could see no discernible change. Had the last of the ancient magics of this place been expended? Was the sacrifice for naught? 
Was it only a matter of time before the inescapable horror emerged from within? They were filled with uncertainty, and each responded to the call in their own way. As Rowena cradled the body of her dead companion, she contemplated that it was the second she had seen die in this exact same spot. Thank you, friend. We remember your sacrifice always. Was it enough for the ritual, do you think? Don't you fucking go there. I don't mean... I mean... You know, this is the first time in quite some time that the air has been so clear, so crisp. This is one of my favorite things about the surface. Come, Rowena. We haven't the strength to bury him nor the time for a proper funeral on this day. The children are shivering. Surely we must get them home before they freeze or starve to death. What? What? Sister? I don't understand. Sister Cavernsfall approached the team with a kind smile and a tear in her eyes. Lady Cavernsfall, how are you here? Are you a trick? No, Sindri. I came back to say goodbye. And thanks. You sacrificed yourself for us. For me? Are you somehow alive? I don't remember that. But I don't think I'm here. I don't think I can stay. What do you mean you can't stay? Of course nobody is staying here. We're all leaving this forsaken place. I cannot go with you. I just wish to look upon you one last time to congratulate you for rescuing the children, to thank you for taking up my family shield, and to say goodbye. Uh, This is all extremely touching, and I'm sorry to ask this, but do you have any information on how we can seal this door? I I may have um, have fucked things up. Look upon poor Soren and accept his sacrifice. I I think you guys have done it. I think you've done fine. Is that your son? He looks nothing like you. It's a long story. Is the blood flowing the same way it did when I murdered Cavern's Fall the first time around? No, it it doesn't. It almost appears as if... uh... As Sister Cavern's Fall stepped past, toward the forest, toward the edge of visibility in the mist, all present could detect the faintest trace of copper in the air as her sad expression suddenly twisted into a sharp smile, and her voice rang out, Do not fear! More will seek him yet! In a single swift motion, Sister Cavernsfall jerked her head violently, cracking her neck, and fled into the mist, requiring a sanity-saving throw from all. Natural one. What the absolute fuck I got on that one? I've seen worse. Unknown to all except the players, two of the three survivors already had stress damage well into the triple digits. Which meant that things were already very, very unfortunate for them. But now reaching a new marker for a lapse in sanity. You know what? Fuck it. You pass. You've all been through the nine hells and back, so let's just finish this thing off with maybe a happy-ish ending. Suddenly the flames burst to life. The draconic runes were aglow with magic. And all could feel that the gate was alive. Soren suddenly felt his lungs burn as he woke up, gasping, struggling for breath, painful breaths of air. All present knew with complete certainty that the ritual was completed, and that the gate was sealed by Soren's noble sacrifice, but that somehow he'd come back. Soren also knew with utter certainty that the soul of Sister Cavernsfall was present briefly, here in this place, as she guided him back to his body, bringing him back from the brink with a power not dissimilar to his lamp. Although, somehow his heart had mended, and continued to pump blood once again. Her face never shifted, her neck never cracked. She simply said goodbye, and vanished. Soren? Well, that wasn't fun. What's what's going on? Are you you back? back? Did it work? Did did the culture work? What's going on? What? It did work. I, I can't really tell you how, but I know... The gate is sealed. Okay. Okay, let's let's just get the fuck out of here. Couldn't have said it better myself. The journey to Ilmener's Hope took six days. The snow and unforeseen dangers lurking beneath it forced the team to take caution. Yet thankfully, the snow itself made the task of tracking food sources possible. And West Pike's cloak that resisted cold was shared by the children and kept them alive in otherwise abysmal traveling conditions. Upon return to the village, 
Their journey had taken ten months to complete. The welcome they'd hoped for had long worn thin to the point of snapping. Villagers scoffed at their presence and scorned the names of those who left on the journey. The winter was the harshest in recent memory, and none expected the party, nor the missing children, to ever return, having been gone for so long. Ilmater's hope had endured a food shortage, and with their children missing, many had simply given up the will to live. And of those, many gave into despair, choosing to take their own lives. The church, under construction, had long since been abandoned and defaced. It was clear that the town felt abandoned, forsaken by the gods, as its halls were vandalized and its windows broken. Its ornate features either traded for food or else melted down and repurposed. The remnants of the structure were now well known as a house of vice, ill repute, drugs, and those seeking a brief escape from the hope they'd lost months before. News of Lady Granite Pike's death traveled far, it seemed, as on two separate occasions search parties were sent from Strathman's Hole to find traces of her. Only one of the search parties had lied, claiming that she'd been spotted somewhere far, far away, and the reward for information of her whereabouts had now long expired. Similarly, an interested party visited Ilmeter's Hope, searching for Father Westpike, a human with a unique arrangement of scars and tattoos, and a set of crooked glasses. He left a note at the inn, which had briefly come under the ownership of a family that had lived next door, a family of trappers, before being seized by men of the human crown, the new law of Ilmeter's Hope. The note had been lost, but according to the former innkeeper and trapper, it contained condolences for Father Westpike on his losses, apologizing that nothing more could have been taken from the old cleric of Pilor, and that he should simply return home. The note lacked a signature, but the edges were stained with black dirt, perhaps coal powder. Before the winter, a raven was sent from the Cavernsfall family, inquiring about their daughter. After a brief yet grim response from the mayor, Sir Delvin Brighthope, no further communication was required. None beyond the destitute trapper family inquired after the fates of the witch Filkia, nor the legendary monster hunter Soren Arkwright, who were both now assumed to have moved on to a new realm and new adventures after failing to rescue the children. But even in returning, Soren was met with indifference, ignored even, which was perhaps better than the others who were overtly scorned. The parents of the young girl, Odd, had apparently taken their own lives, while the parents of Gunther had left for Strathman's hold shortly before the winter. The heroes had survived, and stopped the nameless god from returning, for now and they could each feel a small sense of victory in that. This has been Dark Dice, Domain of the Nameless God. The continuing side stories of Sorin, Rowena, and Sindri will continue on this feed in an effort to bring resolution to their lives. Though if you find their journeys not as horrific as this quest, we will be returning with a new tale of blood-chilling terror on this feed with Story 2 of Dark Dice, Shores of the Silver Thrum coming in 2022. Dark Dice, Domain of the Nameless God. Starring David Alt as Ias Inskeep, Peter Lewis as Soren Arkwright, Ethor Vithyarsson as Father Sindri Westpike, Hem Cleveland as Rowena Granitepike, Cassie Rilinicki as Filgia the Witch, and Caitlin Statz as Sister Savarite Cavernsfall. And I have been your game master, Travis Vengroff. This episode featured Ali Smalley as Aineros and guest voices by David Cummings and Theo Merksmer. Transcriptions were provided by Hem Cleveland. This episode was co-edited by Sarah Baczynski of Polarity Audio Works and Marissa Ewing of Hemlock Creek Productions. Produced with additional editing and sound design by Travis Vengroff, with mixing and mastering by Hemlock Creek Productions. This episode featured music by Stephen Malin, Travis Vengroff, Sam Bose Miller, and Fui Ma Dane. To support this production and get access to bonus releases, music, world lore, art, and early access to future adventures and D&D materials, please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash libertypodcast. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram as at darkdicepod. This is a Fool and Scholar production. Thank you for listening. <laughs>